And our top, top story this morning has got to be the big banks who are starting to report JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, BlackRock. That means no rest for the weary. Brian Chung with us right now to talk us through some of the numbers. Um, and, and Brian, what really stands out to me and what was sort of hinted at in the Jeffries numbers that came out a couple of days ago, weakness in fixed income revenue, which seems to be now a theme across the banks. Yeah, and you rewind to the depths of the pandemic, and the big trend at the time was that those money center, big markets focused banks were the ones that were doing well. The bread and butter consumer banks were not doing so well. Maybe starting to see a little bit of a reversal, at least based on the initial earnings that we've gotten. Let's start off in Midtown Manhattan with JP Morgan Chase, the nation's largest bank revenue, coming in at $30.4 billion on bottom line adjusted earnings per share of three bucks and 33 cents, beating estimates on both the top and bottom line. And Julie, you highlight the really interesting number that kind of isn't seen in those uh, headline numbers, $3.3 billion in fixed income commodities uh, sales and trading. That fell short of the street's estimates of about $3.4 billion. And also take a look at equity sales and trading, also missing the mark quite a bit, $1.9 billion versus the street's estimates of about uh, $3 billion. You can see the numbers on the screen ahead of you in terms of those breakdowns of the different types of revenue lines for the bank there. Jamie Dimon, the CEO, saying that the economy continues to do quite well despite headwinds related to the Omicron variant, inflation, and supply chain bottlenecks. But again, maybe reduced volatility, at least in the markets, leading to fewer revenues, at least in the investment banking side of things. But let's take the E-Train downtown to Citigroup, if you will, also here in downtown Manhattan. The revenue coming in at $17 billion, just squeaking out above the street's estimates of $16.8 billion. Adjusted earnings per share, interestingly, coming in at a buck 46 short of the street's estimates. You don't see that too often in the banking industry. Now, they had a similar story with regards to a market slowdown in fixed income, $2.5 billion in total fixed income markets revenue compared to the street's estimates of $2.7 billion. So again, Wall Street not expecting this type of slowdown uh, as we saw in fixed income. That's a 20% year-over-year decline, by the way, pretty comparable to the 16% year-over-year decline that we saw at J.P. Morgan Chase. But a lot of moving parts here with Citi. They're changing shape. Actually, they exited uh, their retail bank business in Mexico to focus on institutional and private bank businesses. Jane Fraser, the CEO there, is calling it a refresh of our strategy. But again, Citigroup changing a lot, especially when you consider they exited four businesses in Asia. But let's hop on a plane now, go out to San Francisco, California, where another major bank reported. I'm talking about Wells Fargo, of course. Fixed income, not as much of a big story for Wells Fargo because they're more of a consumer bank. In fact, their fixed income trading business is less than a billion dollars, so it's really not even worth mentioning. What we want to see is the underlying loan pipeline for this bank because they're so consumer facing. Things actually look pretty good on that front. The revenue coming in at $20.86 billion. They beat the street's estimates on the bottom lines, but average loans actually decreased 2.7% on a year over year basis but they still increased their revenues by about 13% year over year. How did that happen? Non-interest income going up 27% year over year. Keep in mind though, this might be changing. Wells Fargo is among the other major banks that said they would be reducing their overdraft and their uh, non-sufficient funds fees. That's good for consumers, but obviously how will that impact their non-interest income numbers? We'll have to see in the quarters to come. And if you thought we were done, a little bit of a head fake. I've got one bonus bank for you. We're talking about BlackRock here. They're not your bank's bank. They're really more of an asset manager, but worth mentioning here, they had revenue of $5.1 billion, just their earnings per share of 10 bucks and 42 cents. Total assets under management up 15% on the year. That's the trend for BlackRock through this post-pandemic period. But interesting to see that expenses actually got bigger for employee compensation and benefits, up 16% year over year, showing the bid up in wages, at least on Wall Street in the labor market there. And the guys, this is a trend that you're seeing at the other banks as well. And as a reminder, I'm not done with the bank earnings. We got Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. They won't be coming, though, until next week. So at least I'll get a little bit of a breather over the weekend, guys. <laughs> Brian, were there any other positives in these reports? Because bank stocks were set up. Really, they have been priced for perfection. And, you know, the market is expecting these names to show some good profits later this year when the Fed starts hiking rates. Well, I mean, you can make the argument that uh, maybe they were priced per for perfection headed into the fourth quarter earnings. Obviously, the financial stocks, when you just look at the XLF over uh, the year 2021, was pretty good, especially when you consider how hard these bank stocks got hit 
during the depths of the pandemic. And as you mentioned, a lot of that 2021 uh, updraft was because of the optimism over a steepening yield curve. And for banks that uh, borrow short and lend long, that's often better uh, operating of an environment for these banks to, to kind of serve in. Now, of course, with the Fed hiking interest rates, in theory, that should be good. But you have to remember that, at least in the short term, uh, the effect of hiking interest rates actually leads to a flattening yield curve. So the dynamics are very much different. I think, again, the story is really not necessarily about what is the shape of the yield curve, at least in the short term. It's really all about volatility. And I think when you talk about 2021 and the Omicron variant, and yes, that did introduce some volatility towards the end of the year, uh, the volatility that we saw, at least for capital markets, if you're at a trading desk, just simply aren't as profitable as they were perhaps in 2020. So for in many senses, of course, the pandemic, you don't want to compare anything to 2020. But at least for those trading desks, some of that volatility was very good for fixed income. When you take a look specifically at even Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, it will be very interesting to see what their numbers look like next year. But that story is starting to shift again. Like I mentioned, fixed income, especially with those comps as large as they were in 2020 and parts of 2021, it's going to be very difficult for those money center banks to beat those estimates again. And maybe difficult for them to extend those gains to uh, to Sazi's point with that XLF and near record levels. That's that ETF that tracks the financials. Thanks so much, Brian. We will talk to you again in just a few minutes.